that take home pass. It's very easy. I want everyone to do really well on it. The DBQ is coming up, but I'm not sure exactly what day. So we got through all this. So government aid challenges, we got to this. Can we do any of this? Yeah. So but one thing about it, debt, debt does or spending goes down in good times. And taxes. Okay, let's get the next one. Next, another challenge is government power is going to go up dramatically. Dramatically. And so one of the prescriptions is more democracy. You know, make sure that they're more people uh, make it easier access to vote. That's part of the reason why you know, Roosevelt did want civil rights, even though that never happened, to have more people with the power to vote. But of course, there are holes in this. And once people have power, they don't like to give up the power. And there's a real feeling of fear that the welfare would go to undeserving people. Don't forget, social Darwinism is a dominant philosophy. And this idea of you're giving help, which is aid, which is welfare, that's government aid to anybody. So it could be government aid to rich people, government aid to poor people. But it could go to people who are undeserving. And there might be a lot of resentment with this. And this will be a major factor in the conservative backlash against liberalism in the 1970s. That government aid and protection was going to people who were undeserving. And yes, there was unfortunately a big racial element to this. And this is one of the things that uh, those who tried to perpetuate, liberals who tried to perpetuate the New Deal did a horrible job at trying to continue that. They kept making a lot of means testing and it led to a lot of resentment. But the one thing we have to also remember, one challenge is conservatives hate gains. They don't. They hate demand side economics. Now partially because of ideological reasons, they think that, you know they have economic reasons to support supply side, but also it could be just it could also be uh, social Darwinistic reasons. But by the 1970s, with the economic challenges of the 1970s, especially high inflation, you guys have no idea what inflation is. You might find out, though, if you buy anything with a computer. Anybody know why? There is a, you know why? Say it again. I just couldn't hear you. Yeah. Semiconductors is a massive worldwide shortage. Like, as in, like, oh my God, a terrible shortage. There's only a few companies made of them, and it's just going to lead to. So, anything has a semiconductor, and what has semiconductors now? Everything. Well, really notice it in cars. Car prices might grow up by ten to $15,000. So, we might actually see a little inflation. Not good timing for that. It might not happen, it all depends, but there's like that's unprecedented semiconductor. So let's go ahead and get to this. So this basically though, even though Keynesian economics would become dominant worldwide for 40 years, the, risk, the New Deal reforms ended. So all those three things that he said Roosevelt wanted in that third New Deal, there are others, but the biggies, health, education, and civil rights, they all that. You see little glitches of them coming back. Harry Truman would try to get national health care insurance, but it would be scuttled because of racism. No one blocks having the same health care as whites. That's another story for down the road. So the last two big New Deal laws we passed. First to second AAA. Remember the first AAA was the Agricultural Adjustment Act? And this would instead of paying farmers not to grow crops, it would give them loans and store surplus. And that is why if you drive across the High Line, and who here has made the glorious drive across the High Line? Anybody? 
from Haber to, let's say, Freud, you have? <laughs> you haven't been to Freud? <laughs> that drive across Highline, they told them one word to describe it. What's that word? Beautiful. You feel like you can see the end of the universe. This goes on forever. And because working. Well, the first thing you see in those little towns is a big grain mill. And those are second AAA things to store surplus grain when prices are hot. Our prices are low. When prices are low, they store the grain. When prices begin to go up, then they sell that surplus grain. And this would be the base U.S. agricultural policy until 1973. Whole goal, keep the remaining small farmers alive. Then it's after 73, the hell with them, we want cheap food. And that's kind of what happened. Small farmers were gone. There's no small farmers left. That's a percentage of the population. The other one is a law that affects us to this very day. And this would get through the now more liberal Supreme Court, the Fair Labor Standards Act. And this would be despised by those who like conservative economics, but it would provide a minimum wage. And the minimum wage, the whole idea of wage would be, it was a twofold thing. First off, it would bump up wages, so it's artificial as a wage market, but also, if there's monopolies, wages are pushed down dramatically, dramatically lower. And so this was a hedge against monopolies, the minimum wage is really low now, 725 on the national level. What is it again? Is it eight? 865. 865. Could remember 65 or 95 for the state of Montana. And if we get to, you know, when I was your age, it was 335, and that's about $14 an hour now. There's been a lot of inflation. So minimum wage was higher when I was a, when I was young. When I was young. Now. That was 1924, and. You'll notice this law was passed at the end of the New Deal, so there probably wasn't a minimum wage. And next, 40 hour work week. Yeah, today the minimum wage kept up with productivity would be about $24 an hour. So, boy, somebody making a lot of money off of workers. Next, 40 hour work week. So, this would be enforced by overtime, and this is for people who are wage earners. Uh, there are some people that are in managerial positions who do not get this or accept. Jobs like, let me give you an example of my job. I do not have set hours. We don't always have to be here, but the idea of my job is I'm not working a lot at home and that kind of thing, which I do. I'm pretty amazing, huh? But the whole goal of this one is it raises wages because it makes shifts are longer and it enforces it. How does how is the 40 hour work week enforced? What do you give if you work more than 40 hours in a week? Overtime. Overtime. That's what came out of the Fair Labor Standards. And this, of course, goes against conservative economics, but it's also very popular. It also child labor laws. And this is, they said you can have my job, Dad. This would raise wages for adults, but also allow children to do things like go to school. And it's no coincidence that significantly more people graduate from high school once you have the Fair Labor Standards Act. I agree with it. You people should be in the factory right now with the mines, but no, we're all stuck with you. They've talked about this. Um, there were proposals to weaken this uh, a few years ago uh, when Republicans controlled both houses of Congress, but most Republicans didn't want to go that far, and most people actually don't want to change this. So that's the last major laws of the New Deal. One more thing we have to get to very quickly. Normally, I would show you something. I don't have time to show it to you, really. So this would be a dramatic increase in number of labor unions we mentioned before. And just to review a couple things really quick, the NRA allowed for unions, and but then that was found unconstitutional, but don't forget the Wagner Act. But one important element of labor unions was the election of 1936. Unions just started and they came out and supported what person for president? Yeah, they supported Roosevelt and Roosevelt repaid them by supporting labor unions. He actually was a little bit reluctant until it came about, or until it came to uh, uh, that big victory. But then a new labor union was formed that same year called the Congress of Industrial Organizations under John L. Lewis, who actually um, didn't get along with Roosevelt at all, but that's another story. And this was an industrial union. 
all workers would be allowed in. The AFL, remember the American Federation of Labor? That were skilled workers. And the idea is they would have little tiny unions or guilds for people with that very particular skill. And it was very elitist. This idea is I have my skill, I have um, this special um, special skill that other people cannot be allowed in my union. It's a way to keep out other people. It's mostly white male workers. And Lewis wanted to break up, or wanted the CIO to join the AFL. All workers, they would not allow him in. And so they formed their own union. And this would revolutionize unions in the United States for, well, like I told you, things began to break down for labor unions in 1970. I'm going to show you just a little bit of a clip because you have to see John Lewis. Oops, I don't think the sound will come through. Give me a sec. The internets have been kind of shaky. Okay. I know all the internets. And so this might or might not work. Didn't work very well for this period, but I'm an optimist. More than a year later, in an effort to limit strike violence and protect labor, Congress passed the Wagner Act. Although it did not cover farm workers, extend by the union and backed by the government. That's John L. Lewis. John L. Lewis, president of the United Mine Workers, saw the Wagner Act as an opportunity to organize all industrial workers including the millions of factory workers and blacks and immigrants excluded by the American Federation of Labor. Lewis broke with the AFL and formed the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. So Lewis broke with them, formed a little union, and they showed there's this big... Can I go past it? So this meeting right here is in Philadelphia. And there are a few thousand workers representing unions all over, and it was the AFL trying to hope we to allow in all workers. And then meant also blacks and women. There would be no fight, no group that would fight harder for equal rights for, for all Americans than the CIO, at least then. And there are a couple, um, General Lewis made this point, we'll be a stronger union if we allow in all workers. And then after him, one after the other, cannot allow these people in our union. There'll be a bunch of riprap, they'll drag us down. And uh, one after the other, and then they had the locomotives, union was up there talking, and he was bashing John L. Lewis and saying, you know, we don't want them in our union, being people who are not like us. And they kept saying, and Lewis is sitting, standing off stage, the E, standing watching this, just getting furious right there, this speech, right here. And he walked behind, so his little podium, there are people sitting there. Lewis walked across, and this part is not on film, but boy, I wish it was. Lewis walked in, no preamble, walked in, the guy kind of looked at him and said, yes, this is not what we want. And Lewis came up and ended the speech. Bang! One punch. Knocked him cold. And the whole place erupted like a bar fight in a movie. Everyone's grabbing chairs, they're beating each other, and that's how the CIO started. <laughs> out of the violence of that. And Lewis showed that he will fight for workers. The workers of this country want representation. I'm working on it. They want organization. They want participation. They want protection. They want employment. And they're going to have those things through the leadership and the instrumentality of this new labor movement that you're causing. It's hard to describe what a big deal this was. John L. Lewis's main target was the steel industry. Okay, so 
they would hand out, when they would, workers would come out, they would give out union cards, they'd be scooping up, and workers were desperate for protection. They were scared. As workers are, are today. But the most powerful tool for these work unions would be sit-down strikes. In the winter of 36, 37, there was a series of sit-down strikes at GM, especially their Flint, Michigan factory. And what happened was, a number of very important workers who were in the union, they came in for the morning at work, this is December 1936, and just sat down. Not going to allow the assembly line to work. We're just sitting down. And they did it in different factories, you know, like a uh, part that, that made you know, spark plugs and the various parts that were all over Flint. Back then, the automobile industry was really efficient, much more than today. Much more, which is embarrassing, but it's true how um, much more efficient they were when you think computers. No, you don't know. They just sat down, they shut it down, shut things down. And here, National Guard came out, this time not to put down the track more to just kind of keep it from. Uh, basically to protect the workers inside, but they could not get help uh, from the outside, and they stuck it out. Here are children of workers protesting, and they and their family members threw food to them as they stayed for almost a month in that factory. GM shut the heat down, and they kept it going, and eventually they won. And they, uh, the foreign, or I'm sorry, GM had to recognize the United Auto Workers, which is part of the CIA. Ford, almost the same thing happened. They would brutally attack. Ford's thugs would brutally attack the labor union, but eventually they won that. And the point about this was, the sit-down strike would be the most effective weapon. Just the threat of it, and companies would say, okay, let's just come up with a contract. And this is going to lead to a series of victories. 10 years later, during the short span when Republicans took back control of Congress after World War II, they banned sit-down strikes and they're still illegal. Did a lot to weaken unions that um, are used very effectively today to scare workers from joining unions. And uh, that's kind of a big deal. But uh, they're all trying to act really calm and cool. I guess they were freezing and miserable, but they stuck it out. Yeah, they got better paid. The big thing is working conditions. They're so dangerous. They slowed down the working conditions a little bit. And what this is going to lead to this massive increase in labor which has been falling off the face of the earth now. And also, um, union membership coincides with uh, the Great Depression, and that graph shows right there. So, I know I'm moving fast. Last big thing, we're going to get right to here, the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl, and this is where you sometimes, this, this was used a lot when I was a kid, you probably not heard of it, the Dirty Thirty, many of that. But it was about the dust. And this was the greatest ecological, greatest, it was so great, the worst ecological disaster of the 20th century in the United States. Combination of drought and farming techniques that did not preserve the soil, and in certain areas, over farming led to basically a couple bad years, and then soon the topsoil began to blow away. And this dust bowl. Some of these pictures look like they're from, it looks like it's from the Middle East. Um, you saw something, one of the reasons Iraq would be very open to this, but the same thing, bad farming to that techniques, uh, over irrigation led to that. <laughs> in fact, I have a picture of a former student of mine. He was in Iraq in 2008. And this is his picture of, the, of a dust storm in Iraq. The reason I'm showing it, it looks very much like the death storm we just saw. Let me get to the. I lost the mouse. There we go. Yeah, it looks very similar to that. That's in Colorado. This is my death storm. By the way, the reason I ran part of it so dry, much like a desert, is over irrigation and over, over farming 3,000 years ago. Scary. Dust storm. Terrifying. And that remnants of the dust storm on the bottom, they could tell, some people said they, they could tell the, the, where it was from by the color of the dust. 
as they were passing the soil conservation law on the floor of the United States Congress, dust from Kansas was floating down uh, onto them, onto their desk, covering with it a layer of dust in Washington, D.C. There was an inch thick of dust in New York City. There was dust that would land enough where you could literally have to brush it off all the way to ships going into port in Liverpool, England. And it did potentially block out the sun. And this is going to lead to a whole series of, of migrants. Farmers driven off the land. Uh, most famously, Okies were migrants from Oklahoma, but there would be other names too. And California would be the goal. And California, having their high unemployment, as California had there, a lot of signs to keep people out. Here's to set up an agriculture department to help migrant farmers right here. Here's a migrant family coming across. These are dead animals from the dust storm. Um, I just remember my, my uncle Happy, he's my great uncle, telling me stories about the dust storm in southern Nebraska, the one that hit the uh, farm they were on. This would lead to some soil conservation methods, much better farming techniques, and also the desire, as you mentioned before, like the, part of the reason the, dust, the second AAA passed would be the dust storm. I should add, one of the big reasons why some of you might have heard of this. It's called the Ogallala Aquifer, but there's this massive underwater aquifer they discovered right after the war. And bringing that water up really helped preserve the soil even in bad times. And kind of the blooming of the, mid, of the Midwest, unfortunately the aquifer is going dry. So it's one of those things that if we're kind of on a hinge moment here. We'll see what happens. Hopefully it will goes up and down, and so we'll see what happens. And so here are a couple pictures of migrants going to cross to California. This one is a really sad one. Whatever things they have, a few wheelbarrows in a wagon, a minicab in a truck, have to cross to go to California. And this picture, I just couldn't help it. The, uh, Next time, try to train and relax in California. And there's a whole series of pictures taken. This uh, There's a photographer for the WPA who took pictures at a migrant camp in California. And she took a few pictures of this woman and her kids, migrant woman from Oklahoma. And you can just see the wear, the stress on her face. And this would become one of the most famous series about this and also will desire to do something about the farming problem. So let's get to the last thing, the legacy of the New Deal. And the legacy is gonna be this basic idea, first off, that there is a responsibility, at least more and more people believe this, that government has the duty to help people. Now we can argue what that help is, but most people expect that. They expect that, that if there is an emergency or something really truly bad happens, government has this role. And uh, it's amazing how many people expect this role and, and receive the help. It's just, uh, we just uh, virtually everyone. Next, is that the idea of the government is going to be a broker state between differing interests of the United States. This was Roosevelt's goal. That it would no longer just favor one group over the other. Now, the one he was thinking more than anything else would be those who have the capital and the workers. But it could be between races, it could be between different uh, views on any number of groups. Also, the Great Compression. This would so completely alter the shape that Amer uh, the view that Americans have for themselves, with middle class society. And this ties in with another big thing. It would soon be dubbed the affluent society after World War II. More Americans had more money than ever before to afford to buy some of the trappings of the upper class wealth. And this would dramatically taint the United States, especially when there's still a significant number of people who are not enjoying that affluent society. Yeah. Financial stability, especially remember the glass steagle. There were no major bubbles between 1933 and 2000. Well, let me, let me no financial 
there were no financial uh, panics between 1907 and 2000. There was only one bubble, really, in the late 2000s or late 1980s. There was almost unprecedented financial stability. That as soon as those regulations are watered down, there's the bubble economy back. And as I mentioned before, we, since those, most of those regulations have not returned, there is a bubble forming, it looks like, in real estate. It looks like it's happening. But we'll see. Sometimes they're hard to tell until they explode. Also, the Democratic or Roosevelt Coalition would dominate American politics for the 1980s. Now, they, uh, a lot of uh, the power of the Democratic Coalition was resting on the laurels of the New Deal. But they would dominate, and then they made some terrible mistakes down the road. But also this concept of the imperial presidency. The president got more powerful than ever before. They bought all those government programs. If the government can do all these things, that means that the president has more power because they're the ones who carry out the laws. And you combine that with after World War II and the Cold War, and the president really is almost imperial. And every president... Every president, in some ways, talked about reducing the power of the presidency, and then they all take more power, including the current president, including all the presidents in your lifetime. The one most famous of that would be Jimmy Carter, who made a big deal about getting rid of it, and then we'll see. So this is going to be a true era up until 1979 of liberalism. Now, liberalism is liberal economics, and more and more would come to also be the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement. I like this one. This is from after World War II. Also a series of very, uh, or not very, but liberal presidents. Like, I just like this picture, so any chance I can show it, I show it. Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy. Very liberal presidents. Today, more and more, you say progressive because terms change. And of the Republican presidents, probably the most famous of the Republican presidents of this era was a liberal Republican, Dwight Eisenhower. And it would also help lead to, because of various mistakes, the conservative revival of the 1970s. So the reaction against what they saw is going against traditional values. Here they are about prayer and school against equal rights for women, against equal rights for um, African Americans, whites have rights, and kind of personified by Ronald Reagan. So, we're all coming to all these things, we're always this big cycle in history. Hey, uh, 40 years is a switch, 40 years is a switch. I don't know where we're at now. There appears to be some changes, but who knows what will happen with that. And this can only mean one thing, and I think everybody knows exactly what this is probably going to mean. Fascism! Okay, so let's get to new heading. We're starting World War II and the rise of fascism in the National Socialist. And they go at the same time. Part of the popularity of the New Deal is because they could say we're not fascist and we're not communist. And so, here's the Treaty of Versailles, the brand new map of Europe, and we got to talk a little bit about fascism. This is another word that's misused all the time. And fascists are not communists. Nazis hate communists and socialists. They had a different definition of socialists, but they also wanted to try to fool people. Socialism was really popular in Germany. But let's talk about the rise of fascism. And one important thing I want to know about fascism is an authoritarian dictator. There have been authoritarians before, there have been authoritarians after. Not every authoritarian is a fascist, yet they have common characteristics. Now, so just as on the spectrum, the, the most left is anarchist and communist, and those who consider themselves like progressives or liberal, a little more left, by no means are they communists. Just the same as this is a little bit more to the right, fascism is the furthest right, 
a conservative in the United States is more right, and by no means are they a fascist. It does not necessarily mean that. Well, let me rephrase that. Just because they're a little bit more liberal doesn't mean they're a communist. Just because they're a little bit more right does not mean they're a fascist. These words are thrown out way too much. My favorite is when somebody called a Nazi was a communist. I enjoyed that immensely. That's just something you should probably keep your mouth shut. Oh, by the way, you think nationalism might be a big deal? Be kissing the flag? And that is, I mean, wow. That's a good Italian picture. By the way, she does look good in a beret. Moving on. So World War One. this is where it really begins. Once again, I can't emphasize enough how World War One literally did change everything. But Italy was completely disunified. Italy was disunified before the war. Northern Italy is a heck of a lot different than Southern Italy. In fourth grade, I have a student from Italy, so <laughs> he, will, he will start laughing immediately. Northern Italy is richer, more dominant, and Italy did not do well in World, World War I, especially the 1917 Battle of Caporello right here. They nearly lost Venice, lost hundreds of thousands of men were killed, and they nearly lost war. They barely held on. So Italy came out of World War I feeling humiliated. And then the Treaty of Versailles was worse. They didn't get the land they wanted. They were promised all this land here and also islands in the Aegean and colonies, and they just got a few months of land. Yeah, this was a big deal. But they felt humiliated. We should have got more. By the way, Japan will feel the same way. Germany will be humiliated another way. Out of the war, a veteran of World War I with a man by the name of Benito Mussolini. Before the war, he was actually a socialist newspaper editor. Here he is being arrested for socialist organizing. But during the war, as a veteran who was wounded, he changed. He went from being against the war to for the war, partially because very wealthy interests began to support his paper. And during after the war, he turned in. He turned to right-wing nationalism to rally veterans of the war, also to battle communists in the street of Rome, the streets of Milan, the streets of Florence. It's so weird seeing Mussolini with hair. Every time I see that picture, I'm just, just not used to it. But eventually, they would take the name. Uh, other group that had this, we kind of stole it, but fascism. And fascism comes from Roman history. A fascio or fasc is a bundle of rods. One rod, easy to break. A bundle, strong. And it represented Roman law. So the proconsul would carry the fasc wherever the Romans were to represent Roman authority. In dangerous times for the time of the empire, they would add a battle line saying they had the power to execute. And so to hearken back to Rome as the power of individual, like a finger, you're weak. But as a fist, you're strong. In fact, that'd be an image a lot. Try it sometime. Punch a wall like this. You'll break all your fingers. Punch a wall like this, and maybe just a knuckle or two, right? Don't punch a wall. I know, it sounds glamorous. And that's the fascist symbol. It's clever, isn't it? Harken back to the golden age, the Roman Empire. And this is an idea, don't think it turns a romantic love. It's a romantic idea. It's also romantic, it's also conservative. To go back to a time when we were better, before we were humiliated. Oh, sure, there are problems with Rome. So we're not, we, don't, we don't want to go back to exactly that time. We want to go back to the way it should have been back then. So a lot of rallies in front of the great Roman arena we call the Colosseum. And if you've ever been there, it's amazing, especially if you like stray cats. And here, a fascist symbol that put a bunch of Roman statues. Yeah, the, the Colosseum has thousands of stray cats. It's really the darndest thing I've ever seen. And they're very well-fed, happy straight cats. <laughs> they're just everywhere. And here's a, this is a creepy one, but it's a Roman centurion. See the, 
leading Italian soldiers to victory. I got to admit, if you had the, these guys, I think they'd have a chance to win. But the other thing about the Italian performance in World War II, they obviously did not have them. Or Italian soldiers. But one more big thing. To harken back to Rome, they started doing that salute. Nobody had any idea the Roman salute. So it was made up. The Romans must have did this. Why? Why not? And so here you have little kids learning it. There's Benito. Here's Benito and this other guy doing the fascist salute. I know you want more pictures of fascist salutes. Here's more fascist salutes. Where did it come from? Where do you think it came from? Where? Good guess, but no. Think further west. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the country for which it stands, one nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's the Bellamy salute. Edward Bellamy wrote the Pledge of Allegiance to one win a conference about to win a competition to write a poem or a pledge to glorify republic, which we seen as the best form of government to protect rights. And a republic, people thought he thought of the Roman Republic. So he thought, how would Romans salute in a republic? Needless to say, Images like this would become a little awkward about 1941. <laughs> it's just purely made up. By the way, you know what I said a little bit differently? They added the United States of America after World War I, and they added under God after World War II in 1951 to show we're not God this time. It's a pure Cold War measure. So, tomorrow there'll be more. If you did not bring your review book and don't want to keep it, please bring it in. You're all good people. There'll be something extra in your paycheck, I promise you. Right? Something in your paycheck. Have a great day. Oh, it's got to be before the. So, over the next days, it's actually really short. Yeah, Did you notice it? It's a lot of it's like space. Yeah, I tried to reformat the same space and it just didn't work. So, that's why I saved them and that's what they're fighting. Everybody grab one of these! Grab one, you're good people! I know it's a brand new week and I've given you a gift. Oh, you shouldn't have. Really? Yeah, I'm